Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies and today I'm talking to Ben Norton. Ben is a journalist and analyst. He's the founder and editor-in-chief of Geopolitical Economy Report and lives and reports in Latin America. Ben is also a long-time observer of the non-aligned movement. Covering the recent decisions by all Latin American countries not to send weapons to Ukraine, despite pressure by the US and the EU, he writes that Latin American left-wing leaders have urged peace with Russia and called for neutrality in the West's new Cold War. This is what we will be talking about today. So thank you very much, Ben, for joining me. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Ben, so you wrote this piece recently, I think on the 29th of January, January you published it and um, you are also trying to uh, analyze the non-aligned movement con continuously. I've seen you, you've written about this already years ago. Uh, what's your um, what's your take on where Latin America stands today and the non-aligned movement more generally? Yeah, well, in general, Latin America has always been very supportive of the non-aligned movement. In fact, Venezuela held a summit of the non-aligned movement a few years ago, and we've seen that as the non-aligned movement has become more and more of a prominent force, there are attempts to revive it. Latin America has played a key role. Another organization that you could say is kind of a parallel to the non-aligned movement is the Group of Friends in Defense of the UN Charter, which is... Uh, slightly over two dozen member states of United Nations that are advocating in, for the principles outlined in the UN Charter, specifically non-intervention. And they include many countries in Latin America, including uh, Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia. And now we see w with new progressive governments in Brazil and Colombia and Argentina there and Mexico, which is a, a significant shift. There has been basically a, a massive push across Latin America for more of a peaceful uh, orientation and non-intervention. In fact, there was just a meeting of the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States, the CELAC, C-E-L-A-C. They held their summit at the end of January in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and they asserted in a joint statement signed by all of the members, which is 33 members, calling for peace and neutrality and if you look at UN votes, it's pretty similar. Most of the countries in the region have either abstained or actually voted along with Russia in, in more recent UN votes surrounding Ukraine. And when it comes to providing military support, not a single country has been willing to provide military support. In terms of where they're geopolitically oriented, again, most are neutral and are calling for peace. Mexico, the new president of Mexico, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, he is actually working with the Pope, and he proposed to the United Nations that Mexico could be a sponsor, a mediator for peace talks between Russia and Ukraine, playing a role that, that Turkey has also tried to play. And more recently, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz took a trip to Latin America. He met with Argentine President Alberto Fernandez and asked if Fernandez and Argentina would send weapons, and Fernandez said no. Speaking for, for Latin America as the president, the temporary uh, annual president of the CELAC, he said, neither Argentina nor any country in Latin America is going to get involved and is going to send weapons. That position was echoed by Colombia's new progressive president, Gustavo Petro. He said that the commander of U.S. Southern Command, Lara Richardson, asked Colombia to donate the Russian military equipment that it bought before he became president to the United States and that the U.S. would then send that military equipment to Ukraine. And he said, no, he said, Colombia is not going to get involved in this conflict. We're neutral. And Brazil's new president, Lula Silva, said the exact same thing. So, I mean, I could go on and on basically talking about almost every country in the region, but there are a few exceptions, like, for instance, in Guatemala, the conservative president of Guatemala, who happens to also be a dual Italian citizen, he is the only Latin American leader who has visited Ukraine and met with Zelensky. Excluding him, pretty much every other leader in Latin America has been neutral. And some of them actually have been quite critical of NATO and the United States and the European Union. 
at the moment, I do perceive Latin America and also much of uh, Southeast Asia and India as way more neutral in this conflict than, for instance, uh, let's say Switzerland, Austria or Ireland, which are clearly behind the entire uh, NATO uh, support for Ukraine, even if they themselves do not support militarily the uh, the conflict, but rhetorically they do. Whereas in Latin America, very clearly, uh, also the rhetoric is quite different. And on the part of the United States and the EU, you then often hear that well, this is uh, this is supportive of the Russian war. Um, where how do you how do you perceive how big is the pressure? on on uh, especially latin american countries to um fall in line certainly there is a lot of pressure largely coming from the us of course the european union has tried i mentioned olaf schultz visited but it's mostly from the united states now to be fair many of the countries in the region have criticized the russian invasion of ukraine so they're obviously not openly endorsing the invasion so the idea that they secretly support the Russian invasion is not true. In the case of, uh, for instance, in Brazil, Lula da Silva just returned to power on January 1st. He did criticize the Russian invasion. However, he also said in comments that Zelensky bears significant responsibility as well for not uh, supporting peace talks, for continuing to escalate, for pushing for more military assistance and tanks. And he said that, of course, the US and NATO bear responsibility for expanding right up to Russia's borders. And same, the same thing with uh, Colombia's president, Gustavo Petro. He did criticize the Russian invasion and said, we do not support invasions of any country. Although he did point out, we also would not have supported invasions of the Middle East, of Iraq and, and countries like that. And it's the same story with Argentina. Now, the countries that do have much closer relations with Russia, which are Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, they did not condemn the Russian invasion, although Cuba has been very careful in its diplomatic statements, saying that they want to uphold the UN Charter and they oppose the violation of country sovereignties. So they were being very diplomatic and they didn't mention Russia and condemn Russia openly. But uh, in general, across Latin America, I mean, even among more conservative forces, of course, there's a clear trend that left wing leaders, which tend to be much more critical of the United States and Europe, I mean, for having a history of, you know, meddling in their internal affairs and organizing coups, they they have tend to, tended to be much more neutral and critical. But even there are more conservative forces in the region. Bolsonaro, who is he, the former president of Brazil, who's very right wing, very far right. He, when he was president of Brazil right until the end of 2022, he also maintained neutrality, which did surprise a lot of people. But that's largely because of Brazil's economic interests. Brazil relies very heavily on fertilizer exports from Russia, and Brazil's exports are dominated by agriculture, agri agricultural products. So, I mean, there is certainly as with all of geopolitics and di diplomacy, there are always economic interests. But the reality is that Brazil abstained in a lot of those votes at the UN, and Brazil is part of the BRICS bloc with Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. So even under Bolsonaro, there hasn't really been a shift. Now, what one difference is that Lula has been trying to push for more pr um, protagonism for Brazil on the global stage. He wants Brazil to be a significant voice pushing for non-alignment and neutrality and peace. And he has proposed, along with the Mexican president, López Obrador, Lula has now been proposing that Brazil holds peace talks between Russia and Ukraine. And he said that he's going to be talking with President Biden in the U.S. to try to sponsor a, a peace process. So, I mean, again, I just want to stress the point that pretty much every almost every single country in Latin America has maintained this neutrality. And you can say that in general, the left wing forces have been much more critical. There are some right wing forces, especially in Venezuela, which is a country where Russia has a very close relationship with the Venezuelan government. In Venezuela, the right wing opposition has been very pro Ukraine and has been holding, you know, digital events with Zelensky. But that's a more special case. I mean, in general, uh, the biggest countries in the region, which are Brazil and Mexico and Colombia and Argentina, they have all been completely neutral in this process. And in fact, uh, the president of Argentina, Alberto Fernandez, a few weeks before Russia invaded Ukraine, he obviously didn't know this was going to happen, 
he took a trip to both Beijing and to Moscow and Argentina joined the Belt and Road Initiative and Argentina has applied to join the BRIC, extended BRICS plus bloc. So again, it shows that a lot of these countries, they're maintaining positive relations with the US and Europe. They're not breaking off relations, but they're also balancing those relations like we saw in the original non-aligned movement. Yeah, any real neutrality always maintains ties to both sides of a conflict. That's kind of in the that's in the heart of the concept. So thinking that it's it means like withdrawing and not doing anything, it's usually exactly the opposite. But so but when we didn't talk about the original non-aligned movement, which was very, very huge, also in, in terms of public perception, right around the early 1960s, when it then was formed in 61 in Belgrade, and you know Yugoslavia was kind of the only larger uh, European member of the, of the movement. The rest of the movement was outside of uh, colonial Europe, uh, uh, Latin America, Southeast Asia, Africa, um, almost all the independent African states were, of course, in there. But... Uh, the movement itself had a lot of uh, trouble, let's say, organizing internally because it was always con conceptualized as a movement, not as an organization. And there were they always moved at very different speeds and were um, like in terms of impact on world politics. Uh, they had an impact clearly. They were um, also perceived and they were uh, reckoned with, um, but. I w my personal impression is at the moment, this new non-alignment that seems to be forming, especially around Latin America, what you're saying, also like the taking uh, countries taking uh, diplomatic leads to, uh, to convince the warfaring parties to actually uh, sit down and, and, and talk about it all. It seems to me that it's stronger this time is... Do you have a similar perception or how do you what how do you compare what's going on currently with the non-aligned movement, how it formed in the early 60s? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that it is definitely stronger now. I mean, as you know better than anyone, the non-aligned movement took many years to grow. And even then, it, it was kind of aborted really early on. But you can see the early origins of the non-aligned movement in, in the Bandung conference in 55 and attempts at, uh, you know, uh, Afro-Asian unity and all of that. And I think in, in Latin America and Africa, we definitely see that today. And also with parts of Asia, you mentioned, especially Southeast Asia, but also India, of course, India being one of the main co-founders of the non-aligned movement under Nehru. What has been pretty interesting is to see that even the current Indian government, which is very right wing, and typically the, the left in India had been much more leaning toward the former Soviet Union and today Russian Federation and and the conservative forces of the BJP had tended to be much more pro-US. So uh, the current Prime Minister Narendra Modi was pretty close to Donald Trump. But despite that, India has actually maintained complete neutrality. And a lot of that has been attributed to economic interests, but also to the fact that the Indian diplomatic corps is apolitical. The Indian diplomatic corps is very well trained. These are, these are very skilled diplomats. And they're not nearly as politicized as somewhere like the United States, where the d diplomatic class in the U.S. is very partisan and linked to the Republican or Democratic parties. So it's it's been interesting to see India's protagonism as well in this process in, as, a, as a BRICS member, as a country that has been maintaining positive relations with, with both sides. I do think that the situation today is very different. So even though, yes, the non-aligned movement is significantly stronger and has expanded and includes the vast majority of the global population, we're not at the same level of rivalry, I think, in terms of the in terms of how hot that rivalry is, as we were at the peak of the, the first Cold War. I mean, I think, unfortunately, we very much are in a new Cold War. We've seen going back to 2018, the Defense Department in the United States revised its national defense strategy and said that the top threat to U.S. national security was no longer non-state terrorism. It was rather China and Russia. And they just published their new, the, in October, the De Defense Department published its new national defense strategy, which even in even more aggressive language reiterated that China is the top threat. They use the term threat to the United States as well as Russia. And we've seen, you know, of course, Donald Trump started a trade war, the imposition of sanctions, this now this war in Ukraine. Clearly, we're in a kind of new Cold War. But unfortunately, unless it can be de-escalated, which I think is a possibility, 
but there seems to be much more momentum pushing toward escalating the conflict. And I say that as someone from the United States, I, I've lived in, lived in Latin America for several years, but I, I have my finger on the pulse of the United States. And there's a lot of hysteria, especially around China. We saw this in the past week with this alleged spy balloon. I mean, the point is that it seems to be that this conflict is getting hotter rather than colder. And I do expect in the years or potentially decades to come, it may be harder for certain countries to maintain neutrality. The U.S. and maybe European countries, but largely the U.S. may pressure, especially countries that are more of its strategic allies, countries like South Korea, Japan, some of the Gulf, Gulf states. We saw this in an attempt with Saudi Arabia. The U.S. may attempt, uh, attempt to pressure them to firmly pick a side. But thus far, I mean, it's indisputable that most countries in the world have maintained neutrality. We were talking about Latin America, which I think, along with Africa, are probably the, the continents where there is the most neutrality and refusal to, to pick one side. But even what's been really surprising is to see the, the Persian Gulf, countries like Saudi Arabia and Qatar and the UAE, which historically have been very close to the US and to Europe. Some of them were former British colonies, and, and basically their states were created by the British Empire. And even they have maintained neutrality in this. We saw that Saudi Arabia has it, it refused U.S. pressure to increase oil production and to pressure OPEC to ease, increase oil production and OPEC plus, which includes Russia. And we saw that actually Saudi Arabia just invited uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping to Riyadh, and they announced that they're going to be considering doing oil and gas deals with China in the Chinese currency, the renminbi. So obviously Saudi Arabia is still a major U.S. ally. They still have many political and economic ties. But the fact that this key Western ally has been so able in public, not even privately, out in the public and its public statements been able to balance both sides, I think really shows we are in a very different kind of world. That is absolutely true. The entire the, the entire surrounding of what we are seeing going on is actually much more enabling, I would say, for neutral actors because they are larger economies today. They are they have um, bigger productive capacities and so on. So, as you rightly say, the BRICS uh, states getting together or or, or growing um, that would su significantly shift the the power balance, especially in in uh, economic. Uh, in economic affairs, but what I am very much afraid of is that the pressure on these on these neutral and non-aligned countries is going to grow significantly. At the moment, it is growing, especially from the side of the EU and the United States. I think uh, Russia and China at the moment are rather content both with the the non-support uh, toward toward the the Western um, Western pressure by the non-aligned movement. That's also why the West then interprets uh, non-alignment as a form of support and as as, um, as Russian propaganda. Basically, um, what I'm worried very much is that the that that the U.S. might increase pressure significantly. Uh, once uh, a bit of uh, capacity is created, do you think that the let's say Latin America has today the the ability to resist? I saw you also wrote a piece about Monroe Doctrine at two hundred. Um, it has been U.S. the U.S. policy for two hundred years that Latin America is its backyard and it has to fo follow. And when it doesn't, like in Panama, like in Nicaragua. Um, there will be invasions, you know, um, brute force is going to be used. Um, do you see any potential for um, U.S. interventions, direct interventionism in uh, Latin America as a outcome of non-compliance? It's very hard to predict. What I can say is there has been a, a gradual trend toward other diplomatic and economic tools as opposed to direct military intervention. This is true around the world. I mean, since the, the end of what you could say the first Cold War in 1991, we've seen that the, the US use of sanctions, unilateral course of measures has exploded, not, not only against Iraq originally, which is the kind of first target, but especially in the past decade, we've seen a massive increase in the use of sanctions against Russia, of course, China. The Biden administration has continued expanding sanctions on China that Trump started.
the Biden administration just imposed sanctions on China to prevent access to semiconductors, um, microchips, and quantum computing technology, advanced parts. So, I mean, this, this continues to escalate. But in, in the case of Latin America, we've seen a huge increase in sanctions. The Trump administration expanded with over 200 new sanctions on Cuba. I'm in Nicaragua, and the United States has imposed many rounds of sanctions on Nicaragua as well. And of course, Venezuela has been targeted by, I mean, an unimaginable amount of sanctions targeting its oil sector in particular. And being a country where it basically has been a petro state for since the 1940s for over 80 years, according to the top UN expert on sanctions, Alina Duhan, the UN special rapporteur, she said that the Venezuelan government lost 99% of its revenue because it basically all came from oil. So we have seen those forms of meddling, which is really economic warfare. And I think that those that we can expect that to expand, the use of sanctions to expand. For instance, Colombia, the new left-wing president there, Gustavo Petro, when he entered office in August, he immediately reestablished relations with Venezuela, which had been cut off for several years before. And specifically, the border between Colombia and Venezuela had been closed, including to bilateral trade, which obviously did significant economic damage to both countries. So he reopened the border and he announced the, the resumption of flights. But in response, the U.S. said that if Colombia allowed Venezuela's state-owned uh, airliner, which is called Combiasa, then the U.S. would impose sanctions on Colombia's air authorities. So we've seen threats against sanctions all across the region. But I, I think Latin America does have the capacity to resist this. Now, whether or not the U.S. will re return back to, you know, Panama style invasions, Grenada style invasions, the Contra style war in the 80s in Nicaragua, it's hard to tell. I mean, I could see that happening, especially if someone like Donald Trump comes back or potentially a very hardline Republican like DeSantis, the Florida governor who's being considered a Republican presidential candidate. Historically, Democrats have preferred less direct forms of intervention, although they still have been interventionist. I mentioned especially sanctions, which exploded under Obama. And Obama's one of Obama's top Iran officials who's been brought back by Biden. His name is Richard Nephew. He oversees sanctions policy in the State Department targeting Iran. He wrote a book called The Art of Sanctions. And in that book, he acknowledged that the U.S. goal is to do economic damage to these countries. He boasted that U.S. sanctions on Iran caused the price of chicken to triple in Iran, which obviously doesn't hurt Iranian elites. It hurts the Iranian people, right? It doesn't hurt the Iranian military. So we've seen a massive increase, especially under Democrats, of the use of these non-conventional measures, you could say unconventional warfare. And I think that's really what's going what's to be the main tool in the toolbox in the years coming forward. That's why in Latin America, we actually have seen a move toward the creation of a new currency. It's something that I do a lot of reporting on. I'm involved in research on in the region. And in fact, the new Brazilian president, Lula, just announced in his meeting in Argentina, just three weeks after coming into power, that they're beginning preparation to figure out a way to create a new currency for bilateral trade. And a lot of that is because these leaders recognize that if they carry out policies and especially vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia, that the United States does not like, they can be threatened with sanctions. And I mentioned that Argentina's president, Fernandez, took a trip to Beijing and Moscow, but he also, of course, took, he's been maintained positive relations with Washington, which is, again, what real neutrality is. At the same time, he ha recently signed, the Argentine Central Bank signed an agreement with the Chinese Central Bank to do currency swaps between the two countries in Chinese yuan, and Argentine pesos. And I think I expect those kinds of policies to continue in the, in the future with the use of other currencies that aren't the dollar. And of course, this is something that frustrates Washington and might lead to more sanctions. So I think Latin America, my view that I've asserted a lot is we're in an, a multipolar world. And, and it's, the non-aligned movement is really an attempt to make sure that world remains multipolar and not bipolar. That's the whole point of the non-aligned movement. We don't want to just pick one pole on the bipolar world. And I think especially now with, with Brazil being the sixth most populous country with a massive economy and significant industrial capacity, I do think, and with a leader who's interested in regional integration, 
I think Latin America will, in the decade and two decades coming for, going forward, will be a kind of new pole in this multipolar world and will maintain neutrality. And you, you mentioned you know, the Monroe Doctrine. This is the 200th anniversary. That's why we've seen a reassertion of the Monroe Doctrine by so many politicians in the U.S., particularly Republicans. And we've seen Donald Trump himself, his secret, both of his secretaries of state, Rex Tillerson and Mike Pompeo, and also his national security advisor, John Bolton, all of them invoke the Monroe Doctrine specifically to refer to Latin America's relations with China and Russia. And after Argentine President Fernandez took those trips to Beijing and Moscow in February, two weeks before the Russian invasion, a, a Trump affiliated congressman from Florida, Matt Gates, he gave a, a very heated, angry speech on the floor of the US Congress in which he said, that this is a violation of the Monroe Doctrine. And he said, Argentina is now a threat in our backyard. So a lot of that rhetoric surrounding the Monroe Doctrine is specifically about bilateral relations that countries in Latin America have with China and Russia specifically. And especially now considering that in South America, a majority of the countries in the region actually have, they do more trade with China than with the United States. And that's a trend that's likely gonna continue. That is highly interesting, and you know, of course, this the, the hypocrisy is amazing when you when you hear the the leaders of the free world saying everybody is free to choose their alliances. Everybody, if you're Ukraine, you can join NATO as much as you want. If you're Latin America, you have you're free to do as we tell you to do, as we've been telling you for two hundred years. You know, international relations would be much less frustrating if there wasn't these double and triple standards that are just mind boggling, um, but. Let me maybe um, ask you one more question about the the use of this concept. So, you know, neutrality has gained quite a bit of a bad reputation, especially during the last 30 years after the after the end of the Cold War. And um, also before that, you know, non-alignment was, especially in like Western media, never something that was really positively connotated and has has rather been dragged through the mud. Um, so a lot of uh, European countries at the moment avoid the word or don't use it that actively anymore. There are some exceptions like Serbia and Moldova, uh, especially Serbia. But, you know, from the Western perspective, the Serbs are looked at as as, as Russian uh, um, uh, toys, right, uh, as, as just going along. Um, is that different for Latin America and maybe also for the other part of the non-aligned movement? Is there a awareness that they are proud of using um, the term neutrality or non-alignment when they refer to themselves. I mean, non-alignment is a term that's frequently used. I mean, I mentioned that in 2019, there actually was a, a summit of the non-aligned movement in Caracas, in Venezuela. And that was actually at the peak of the U.S. attempt to overthrow the government and replace it with Juan Guaido under the Trump administration. And there was, I mean, the Venezuelan government spoke openly of non-aligned, not the non-aligned movement. Now, um, I think what's interesting is if you look at in Latin America, I would say there are kind of three main political groups. And, and I, I think in Latin America, the issue of non-alignment is a bit different compared to other regions, especially Europe, where in Europe, many of the forces that are, that what you could say would be considered neutral, non-aligned, tend to lean more conservative, especially in Hungary, for instance, but also Serbia. In Latin America, it's the opposite trend. It tends to largely be the left-wing forces, and the right-wing, more conservative forces tend to be much more pro-U.S. But um, within, so there, I would say there are three main political camps. So there is the right-wing camp, but then there are also, two, I would say, two, two left-wing camps. They're not necessarily separate. There is some overlap. But in terms of their foreign policy, there are differences. I would say that there is the more socialist camp, which is more explicitly anti-capitalist, and the more progressive camp. And there are overlaps, especially Bolivia as a country that overlaps. Bolivia is a member of the Bolivarian Alliance, which was founded by Cuba and Venezuela. So Bolivia is part of that alongside, Bolivia, uh, alongside Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. But Bolivia is also a member of the Puebla group, which is a coalition of the progressive forces, which includes Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil. So they're, they're not antagonistic. I mean, they, they have positive relations with each other, but they have different policies. And in terms of their foreign policy, I mean, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua are very, very pro-China and are 
pretty consistently much more supportive of Russia, whereas the more progressive camp tends to be very neutral. And that's obviously, I think, for geopolitical necessity. It's because the U.S. has sanctions on Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and they basically don't really have diplomatic relations. And, you know, the U.S. has been trying to overthrow their government, so I don't expect them to have positive relations with the U.S., I mean, until recently, many the U.S. still and many European countries did not even recognize the Venezuelan government as legitimate. So it, that explains that policy. Um, they tend to be very pro-China and also pretty pro-Russia as well. In in the case of the more progressive camp, which you could say is uh, is around the Puebla group, and it's called that because it was founded in Puebla, a city in Mexico. They are very neutral, and those are the countries that are. They have positive relations with the U.S., but also very positive relations with China and Russia. And, and a very good example of this would be the Mexican president, López Obrador, who has given many speeches talking about non-aligned movement. I mean, non-aligned mint. I don't think he's referenced a non-aligned movement, but he has used the term non-aligned. And Brazil as well, under Lula, has used the term non-aligned. So clearly they're referencing the non-aligned movement. When that summit was held in Venezuela, they had representatives there's also another organization in Latin America that brings together left-wing forces, which is called the, the Sao Paulo Forum. And they also have observer status with an online movement. So, I mean, in the case of Latin America, because of the, because of the legacy of the online movement as a project largely in the global South. And also, I mean, another important point is that I agree with you 100% that the non-aligned movement has been given a very bad reputation by the West. And it was falsely portrayed as like secretly actually allied with the Soviets. I mean, many of those countries, those leaders, they were very serious about non-aligned movement. But because they weren't explicitly anti-Soviet, they were portrayed in the West as pro-Soviet. But we also should be clear that although that narrative is not true, what is true is that the non-aligned movement was almost entirely founded by left-wing forces. And in the case of Latin America, it very clearly echoes that, right? So you had Nasser in Egypt. You had Tito in Yugoslavia, Sukarno in Indonesia, Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, and Nehru. All of them were leftists. And similarly, in today in Latin America, the forces that are in, involved in the non aligned movement are left wing forces. So for them, not like the countries in Europe, maybe that, I mean, I guess you could say former Yugoslavia, but it, you know, Hungary wasn't involved in the non aligned movement at all, obviously. Excluding them, I think in Latin America, they are direct. Uh, they are the direct successors of the online movement, and they see themselves as such. Ben Norton, that was a wonderful analysis. Thank you very much, everybody. Go and check out his uh, page, the Geo Geo Economic Report. I will I will put a economy report. Geo Political Economic Report. I will put a link to that in the description. Ben, uh, wonderful work you're doing, and I hope to stay in touch with you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you for the important work, work that you're doing about this, this topic that should be talked about more, neutrality. Thank you very much. We can collaborate on this as much as you want, because I do think we have to push for, for more of this neutrality in order to keep this place stable. Yeah, yeah, that would be my pleasure. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.